What is up, YouTube? I'm Devon DaVinci, leader of the Renaissance Crew, and you're watching DaVinci Reacts. Today, I'm going to be getting into the new episode of Oversimplified. A lot of people have told me that this video was out, but just know, I was aware of it. <laughs> I've told you I don't do reactions to YouTube content creators until a couple weeks have passed, or at least I try to. Sometime I've done reactions and I've actually accidentally looked and been like, oh, this is new. Damn. <laughs> but uh, normally if I have any knowledge of it, I'll try to wait and give it some time so that the original content creator can get some uh, of the initial views and everything. Because despite the fact that me constantly warning you to watch the original before you watch the reaction, I know there are a fragment of people out there that will not watch the original. So that is my way to encourage you to watch the original first. <laughs> um, I am subscribed to Oversimplified, so anytime that, that wasn't intended, I didn't try to rhyme that. I am subscribed to them, so every time they upload a video, trust me, I know it. Now, this is the Russian Revolution, uh, 1917, I believe, uh, oversimplified version. There's a lot of different events that I would like to see them cover, in particular the Vietnam War, but at the same time, I gotta stop being so American-centric. <laughs> the world doesn't revolve around America, goddammit, so uh, yeah, let Russia get their time to shine. Now, with that being said... Uh, I look forward to what you guys have to say in the comment section down below. I will have a link for Oversimplified at the end of this video. So the last 30 seconds of the video, you'll see an icon pop up. That'll take you to their channel if you click on it. Watch all their videos if you haven't seen them already. Like their videos uh, and all their other good stuff. And, of course, the original link will be in the description box down below. So if you have not seen the original yet, go and watch it right now. Just pause this video. Sometimes YouTube will even save where you last stopped on the video. Watch the original. Come back. Watch my reaction. You don't even have to do it on the same day. Just at some point, watch my reaction after you've watched the original. Now, with that being said, let's check this out. This video was made possible by NordVPN. Click on the link in the description below to get an amazing 68% off a two-year plan. Also, commemorating the weirdest bromance in history. Join over some slides uh, or use their available now. promo link if you want to want to because i use a lot of hey, content Jimmy, that needs it's vpns the 1800s, also. an exciting time to be alive why don't you get out there and explore the world gee whiz mom thanks this place is amazing where am i why you're in france my boy here we come up with wacky new ways of running a country liberty egality fraternity whoa welcome to the united kingdom here we invented the train oh aboard Holy smokes! You're in a German factory, my friend. Here we harness fire and coal to create all these sexy leaderhoods. This is incredible! I can't wait to see where I'll end up next. Russia. Where am I? <laughs> You're in Russia. Have I gone back in time? <laughs> no, this is just how it is. Are you a farmer? Worse. Technically, my landlord owns me, which makes me a serf. I'm scared. You should be, because I haven't eaten in four days, and you look pretty tasty. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, how are your travels? <laughs> I hate you! Mm. Russia in the 19th century. Feudal, underdeveloped, and stuck in the past. While the rest of Europe had been modernizing and improving their citizens' lives, Russia's rulers were taking a different approach. My lord, we're falling behind the rest of Europe. It's time to industrialize, give the people rights, and share your power. Damn! The Czars had no time for <laughs> pathetic ideas like liberty and modernization because they were too busy having the time of their lives. I know I'm going to say something that is not necessarily off topic, but it relates. Um, you see a pattern going on. With the Russian Revolution, it stemmed around um, the people rising up against the upper class or elites. Same thing with uh, France, their revolution, where the people rising up against... Uh, the upper class and elites. So pretty much what history is telling me that anytime the upper class and the elites get too much power or take for granted the people, the people rise up and you have a revolution. Now, America is going through a very similar situation right now. At some point, the people are going to realize that the politicians, no matter what side of the, the political spectrum you're on, does not work for you. They work for the same thing. I've already told you guys my political beliefs, and I know I, you're not supposed to talk about politics. This channel is nobody's safe space. If you have an opinion, leave it. As long as if it's not something crazy, like Hitler did nothing wrong, 
that doesn't belong here. But um, <laughs> this is, like I said, this is nobody's safe space. I've already told you guys I am somebody that is on the left. And not like the typical liberals that you see online with the dyed hair and the people that jump on social issues without looking into any actual context or any type of research. I am somebody that is very much on the left. Now, something that I've come to realize, especially in America, is that both political parties work for the same donors. And there are people like... I'm, I'm, I'm a Bernie guy. Let's put it that way. I'm just being real with you. I'm a Bernie guy. There are people on the Bernie Sanders side that are saying, oh, well, I'm not going to vote because that'll show Joe Biden or I'm going to vote for Trump or whatever the hell else you want to say. But the truth of the matter is that's not going to do anything. Like you think that by not voting, no matter what side you're on, you think that by not voting, you're showing the people that are trying to fight for your vote that you don't need them or something. Like, let's take the Democrats. I say that because that's the side I'm on, so that's the side I know the most about. Let's take the Democrats, for example. They'll sit there and tell you, or the the, the base will tell you, well, don't, don't vote for Joe Biden because it'll just um, show them that if you vote for them, then they're just going to keep doing the same thing. In order to make them learn, you have to not vote for them. But the truth of the matter is, by not voting, they it's not going to do anything. They don't care. You know why? Because whether a Democrat or a Republican gets in office, the person, the, the people in the upper class are still getting paid. That's the, that's the bottom line. It doesn't matter who the hell is in office. Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Obama, all them people are still going to get money. That's all the hell that matters. Like, I've always made this analogy. Imagine if somebody was, like, imagine somebody's robbing you. Like, imagine the, 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 the Republicans run up to you and say, give me your money. And then a Democrat comes down and say, hey, I will, I'll, I'm going to say, I'm going to protect you. Don't worry, they're not going to get your money. And then the Republican proceeds to whoop the Democrat's ass. <laughs> and then they take your money and run the fuck off. The Democrat gets up and goes, Oh, well, you know, I didn't win, but at least I tried, right? <laughs> and then the Democrat runs around the corner, and then the Democrat and Republican split, splits the money that they got from you. And then they go, oh, well, you know, I, I got paid, but at least I tried. Like, that's that's the front. They give you the illusion that one side is with you and one side is against you, no matter what side you're on. But the bottom line is both sides work for the same masters, and they both get paid regardless of whether you vote Democrat or Republican. That's how it's been for decades now. And I know I took this in a completely different position. You can skip if you want to, but um, that's the position that America's in. It's only a matter of time before the people start to realize that the illusion of choice is just that, an illusion. And at that point, I don't know what the hell's going to happen. If you really want to show the people in the upper class, whether it's Republican or Democrat, the that the people have had enough and actually care about voting for someone that represents them, Create a third party or vote third party. That's how you really show them. Vote somebody in that can't be influenced by donations or can't be influenced by lobbyists or anything like that. Vote for someone that actually cares about how you feel. Because if you keep voting or just if you keep voting for the typical politicians or if you keep pretending that by not voting, you're somehow sticking it to the system. All you're doing is continuing to keep this cycle of power going they're going to keep on doing the same exact thing until eventually they've robbed everybody of their damn money and all the money's in the rich and the middle class is destroyed and everybody's in the lower class if you want to really show somebody the that the elite doesn't have if you want to like get the elite out of power vote third party but make sure you research the candidate and vote someone that actually shares your beliefs that can't be influenced by uh, money. That goes for not just America, but any country. Like in America, we pretty much have legalized bribes. If you feel like somebody is is paid by the exact same people that are supposed to be uh, against you or whatever, <laughs> vote for someone that can't be corrupted. And usually that requires voting third party. If the two parties are like the, a big established party or... 
if you're in a country that has more than two parties. If the parties are like establishment, then you might have to really do some research and look into where the money's coming from and things like that. Now, that's a big sidestep, but that's the only big sidestep I'm going to have on this video. Let's continue. While the serfs were breaking their backs in the fields, the czars held all the power, and they didn't have to listen to anyone. Want to run the country like a backwards feudal kingdom while the rest of Europe outpaces you militarily and economically? Go right ahead. Want to keep the people uneducated so they don't get any ideas? There's no one to stop you. Want to keep exporting grain even when there's a massive famine causing hundreds of thousands to die? That is your God-given right. While all of this was great for the Tsar, if you were literally anybody else, it probably sucked because Russia was falling behind. If they were to keep up with Europe, they'd need a strong ruler with some big ideas. Oh look, here comes one now. Hey everyone, it's me, Tsar Alexander II, and I've got some big news. I'm releasing you all from your serfdom. You're all free. Yes! Yep, I'm the best. Oh, there is one thing though. I spoke to your local lords and they weren't happy about losing all their free labor. So as a compromise, you're all gonna have to pay them back a near impossible amount of money for the next 49 years. Expect your lives to barely change. Okay, bye. Now I know what you're thinking. This Tsar Alexander II seems like a pretty cool guy. That's like in America when um, after, sl after the slaves were freed after the Civil War, a lot of slaves went right into like sharecropping. It's almost the exact same thing. Like Your life barely changed. <laughs> you can technically define yourself as free, but you're in debt, so you have to work until you're out of debt. And oh, it just so happens your debt is long enough to last your entire life. <laughs> that, that never changes. Now I know what you're thinking. This Tsar Alexander II seems like a pretty cool guy. He's trying to reform the country and get Russia on the right path. Everyone must love this guy, right? Wrong. Why does one man get to decide the fate of everyone in the country? This whole system is dumb. Somebody should do something. Like what? Like kill the Tsar. You're gonna kill the Tsar? Well, me, no. I'm busy. I was kinda hoping you'd it's do like it. It's like Lenin and Trotsky. <laughs> okay. See? The people love me. They're throwing flowers, confetti, and high-grade explosives. <laughs> okay, Nicholas, your grandfather has a mild case of being blown up by a terrorist, and he's not looking too hard, so we're going to go say our goodbyes, uh, okay? No, it'll be too scary We don't scary have a cure for that just yet. Nonsense. It won't be scary at all. We're just going to say a quick goodbye. Ready? Boy, look at me. <laughs> the people did this to me. And one day, <laughs> they'll do it to you! See? It wasn't scary at all. So Alexander II was dead. That kid Luckily, is traumatized. He had another Alexander lying around. Alexander III. And he felt his dad's reforms had weakened the Tsar's authority. Oh, man. Russia was massive. And as a result, had many ethnic minorities. Non-Russians? More interested in their own cultural heritage than in loving me? Isn't it great? So much beautiful culture and diversity in our great nation. Alexander thought all these minorities should be a little more Russian and thereby loyal to him. So he repressed religious minorities. He repressed non-Russians. Just a quick call back to that little map they had. I saw that they had a lot of ethnic groups in Russia covered a lot of different areas. But didn't the whole thing about the Soviet Union was that they were setting up puppet governments in those very countries that looks like uh, Russia had a lot of control of. Um, did Russia have control of Ukraine? back then i mean i imagine they did because i looked at the territory and it was there but when did they lose ukraine and then regain it again under the soviet union because i could have sworn like ukraine was one of those uh governments they took control of during world war ii but that would mean they wouldn't have to have control i, I could be all wrong but let me know he introduced the Okhrana, a secret police force that repressed anybody who thought having a czar was dumb. If secret Alexander II force. was the great reformer, Another Alexander symbol. III was the great repressor. Now that's how you run a country. Hey, Dad? Ugh, great. It's my son Nicholas, who I like to call a girly girl because he's so weak and pathetic. When are you mm. gonna grow up? Hmm? Eh, you still look like a girly girl to me. But Dad, I grew a beard. Yeah, an ugly girly girl beard. <laughs> Just like your mom! Nicholas was to one day be czar, he needed his dad to teach him how to run the country. But his dad instead suggested that Nicholas go somewhere else. So Nicholas went to Japan, got an edgy dragon tattoo, had his head sliced off by a policeman, go was somewhere true? else. So Nicholas went to Japan, got an edgy dragon tattoo, had his head sliced true off story. by a policeman, and then came home. Now will you teach Again, me how true to story. Rule? <sighs> I suppose it's time. Okay, there's a lot you need to know before becoming czar. Uh-oh. What? I've got kidney inflammation. 
Oh no. Upon his father's Don't death, know. a totally unprepared Nicholas II ascended to the Russian throne. He wasn't a reformer like his grandfather, nor was he a repressor like his dad. Nicholas was Nicholas. Timid, easily swayed, and more interested in doing whatever the hell this is. Or this. Or this. He wasn't ready to rule, and he himself admitted it, saying, I'm not yet ready to be czar. I know nothing of the business of ruling. Bit of an awkward time to bring it up. However, Nicholas <laughs> firmly believed that he was chosen by God to be Russia's big daddy. And while he doubted his ability to rule, he was going to give it his best shot. And hey, who knows? Maybe he wouldn't be so bad after all. To get things off to a good start, Nicholas promised free pretzels and beer to a huge crowd in Moscow to celebrate his coronation, so enticing a proposition to starving peasants that the ensuing stampede left nearly 1,500 people dead. What the hell happened? We're not sure, but you're scheduled to go party with the French at 8 o'clock. Shouldn't I stay here out of respect for the people? When have Russian czars ever respected the people? Hmm. Nicholas's decision to go party with the French immediately tarnished his image. Some were calling him Nicholas the Bloody. The czars had been partying hard at the expense of the people for long enough. They'd emancipated the serfs, but failed to lift them out of poverty. They used their secret police to crack down on anyone who might criticize them, and they'd failed to modernize and give the people rights, something the rest of Europe had begun doing over a century ago. The rule of the czars was quickly becoming outdated, and more and more Russians began wondering if there was a better way. For many, the solution was simple. Just look to the West. Republics, democracies, and constitutional monarchies galore. But I guess in World War I was when they that for an created even all that other idea. territory between Russia and Germany. Communism. Take Vladimir Lenin, an intelligent member of Russia's middle class, and also a massive ill-tempered jerk. If you disagreed with him about anything, he wasn't afraid to call you out. You fat-headed, simple-minded, vapid, cockeyed imbecile! Tender heart bear is a far superior care bear to bedtime bear. <laughs> and he was no stranger to political unrest either. His older brother was executed for plotting to kill the czar. And Lenin himself was expelled from university for participating in a student protest. But how did Lenin go from being a middle class nerd to the arbiter of socialist divinity? Well, to tell that story, we first need to go back a few decades to when like a man named World of Warcraft Marx character. a manifesto explaining how capitalism is a system whereby the stinky bourgeoisie oppressed and exploited the working masses and that only through class warfare could the workers rise up and instate a communist utopia. Now go back forward a few decades to Lenin reading that manifesto and loving it. But publicly admitting you loved Marx and not Russia's big daddy would get you the cruelest punishment imaginable. Exile to Siberia. Enjoy exile where you'll live with your wife, chill around town, and secretly write socialist newspapers. Hey, that doesn't sound so bad. And your mother-in-law is going to live with you. No! <laughs> Once Lenin finished his stint in Siberia, he left Russia for Europe, where he was free to hang out with other Russian Marxists and talk about how great communism was. Now today, you might hear the word communism and think of this. But that's not how intellectuals living under a tough czarist regime saw it. To them, communism promised a land where all were equal, where workers weren't exploited, and even people like you could get a girlfriend. Oh, damn. Communism doesn't sound so bad. Now. <laughs> I'm just playing. Um, communism is an ideal that I think only works in uh, rainbow colored or rainbow filled utopia. That's the only place that communism will work in its entirety. Because I've already told you guys, I'm a bit of a pessimist. I don't have enough faith in human nature to believe that a system like communism would work because you'd have to trust everybody to be equal and always share and not really want anything in return there's no way in hell humans would be able to do something like that it's only a matter of it would only take a few years for somebody to completely corrupt the system i promise you that so for me the ideal system is a combination of something like capitalism and socialism mixing both of them together uh, using capitalism as the the cap, like the, the, the most somebody can get. You can become a billionaire if you work hard enough, but using socialism as a safety net. So you try to reach the top, you don't make it, you fail, but there's a safety net there to make sure that you don't just like die in a gutter. Like you have someone that can give you the bare essentials like food, healthcare, um, education to make sure that you have knowledge of how to reach that upper limit <laughs> but at the same time it's not just like dragging you up to make sure you're successful it just like it keeps you there to make sure that you have all the opportunities and 
the resources necessary to get to that spot. And if you fail, it's okay. You, you have an opportunity to keep going. You only live one time in life, and I feel that you should have the opportunity to, as long as you're living, to constantly be able to, you know, attempt to make it up there. I don't think it's right that it's like you do something and one time you fail. It's like, oh, well, your life's ruined. You can't, you can't go back. <laughs> you're in too much debt. You're, you're just done. Like, there should be some way of making sure people have the ability to constantly uh, strive to be successful. That's, that's my idea. Capitalism, socialism. It's just you got to make sure that there's nothing there that can corrupt the system. Because, again, even that can be corrupted with human nature. So I know socialism and communism would be easy pickings for uh, the easily manipulated. So Lenin joined a party of Russian communists living in Europe, and he founded a communist newsletter that was smuggled into Russia to try to radicalize the people. However, not everyone in the Socialist Party agreed with Lenin. In fact, they disagreed with him on a lot of issues, and Lenin was so uncompromising that he caused a split in the party. During one conference, a heated debate broke out, and Lenin was unwilling to give an inch. You pig ignorant, half-witted, fatuous moron! Nerf herder. Cereal is a soup! Listen, Lenin, you're a smart guy, <laughs> but you have no idea Call what back. you're talking about. We're out of here. All in favor of cereal being a soup? Hey, would you look at that? We're in the majority. So Lenin set up his own faction within the party he called the majority, or Bolshevik if you're speaking Russian. And the other faction became known as the minority, or Menshevik. And oddly, the majority were often in the minority, and the minority in the majority. The Mensheviks were less radical, whereas Lenin wanted the Bolsheviks to be loyal to him and his uncompromising ideas. And if you weren't loyal, well then you're gonna get a big great beatdown. Mensheviks worried that Lenin's attitude could lead to a one-man dictatorship. But come on, does this guy look like a dictator to you? For now, Lenin remained in Europe, writing his socialist newspaper and impatiently awaiting an opportunity to overthrow the Tsar and bring communist utopia to Russia. Cool. A free hat. Who the heck are you? I'm definitely not a Russian secret police officer spying on Marxists. Oh crap, I don't want secret police watching me. Then you, my friend, should use NordVPN. Do you like having your identity stolen? If yes, you need Good. therapy. If no, you need NordVPN. NordVPN has thousands of super fast servers in 62 countries that you can connect to to keep you and your data secure when using the web. It comes with a 30 day money back guarantee and is now faster and more secure than ever with its brand new keeping the ad in. technology. Have you quarantine binged all of your videos? I know this video is going to be long, well, but with I, NordVPN, I don't care. You can watch the Australian version. Or is one of the greatest videos on YouTube still banned in your country? I think you get the point. You can now get NordVPN with six. I have a lot of videos on my channel that are banned in some countries, so plus one month free. VPN so does click work. Click on nordvpn.com well. slash oversimplified in the description below and get protected now. That's nordvpn.com slash oversimplified. And as always, you'll be supporting my channel. So muchos arigatos, mon petit pois. Now where was I? Oh yeah. A timid, easily swayed czar, a massive ill-tempered jerk, impatiently awaiting a communist revolution. And revolution was coming, but not in the way Lenin thought. Back in St. Petersburg, one of the Tsar's most skilled and influential advisors knew the country finally needed to catch up with the rest of Europe. Hey Nick, we really got to industrialize, get more factories, and make some, I don't know, textiles or something. Hmm, won't that change the social fabric of Russia? Maybe. Hey, isn't it past your bedtime? But I haven't had my milk and snuggles yet. Will you snuggle me? Um... Nicholas thought modernization was boring, <laughs> but he let Sergei do his thing. And do his thing he did. He borrowed some money and got Russia some sexy factories. And you know what sexy factories means. Sexy workers. Dirt poor sexy workers. Long hours, low wages, filthy disease-ridden factories. Sleep in overcrowded dormitories with all your stinky worker friends. Get your arms ripped off in a freak Russian doll accident. Conditions were terrible. But this growing working class wasn't about to take it lying down. They started to do what workers do best. See, this is why a pure capitalist system wouldn't work because there's no regulations to protect these workers and there's nothing stopping the factory workers from just like forcing everything on them as far as extremely low wages, no health care, no uh, anything to protect them from on the job accidents and injuries. Nothing. There's no protections at all. So that, again, that's why moderation is key. Uh, there was something I saw. I, I forgot if it was something I reacted to or if it was just a movie that I saw or something. But they had a saying in it that made a lot of sense. It said, moderation works 
or everything is better with moderation except moderation <laughs> it made sense so there you go but this growing working class wasn't about to take it lying down they started to do what workers do best strike Despite Sergei's efforts, people in Russia still weren't happy. Peasants were still poor, liberals still wanted reform, and now the workers wanted better working conditions. And the problem with being an autocrat is that when everyone's unhappy, there's only one person to blame. You. The people hate me. What do I do? Ooh, I know. Why don't we find a weak and pathetic nation to go to war with? We'll win easily, and everyone will love me again. Why don't we just try treating the people better? <laughs> As luck would have it, an opportunity for war was forming in the Far East. Russia wanted to expand its sphere of influence into northern China, and coincidentally, That's how so did America Japan. does it too but a Japan lot of times. didn't really want war, so they proposed an the idea to reduce the war. tension. Hey man, we'll let you do your thing in Manchuria if you let us do our thing in Korea. Uh, I don't think so. We've got the largest army in the world. What do you have? I'm the Emperor of Japan. I have a giant mecha suit. Whoa. Cool. Nicholas nice and the boys suit. didn't see Japan as a threat, so they felt they could push Japan around. But little did they know Japan had been rapidly militarizing, and when they launched a surprise attack on a Russian fleet at Port Arthur, everyone was shocked. Nicholas hoped it was an opportunity to win a quick war and regain the support of the people. Nobody seriously thought a puny Asian country could defeat a European superpower, and the Russian people were filled with patriotic spunk. Hey everyone, superpower? we're at war with Japan! Oh no. Hey everyone. We're losing the war. <laughs> the Japanese won. An embarrassing defeat for Tsar Nicholas. Russia had enough problems, but now it had been internationally humiliated. The public were outraged. Unrest increased. Nicholas needed snuggles now more than ever. The tension was rising rapidly, and Russia was on the verge of revolution. All it needed was one disaster to push it over the edge. And that disaster would come in January 1905 from an unlikely source, a handsome Orthodox priest named Father Gapon. Father Gapon was leading workers and their families to the Winter Palace, but this wasn't some violent uprising. It was a peaceful protest. They wanted to deliver a petition to Nicholas, which simply asked for more freedom and better working conditions. The protest was actually so peaceful and respectful that the Marxists thought it was a big waste of time. Hey Nicholas, some priest is leading a peaceful protest. Says here they want to give you a petition. A peaceful petitioning priest? I better get out of here. Nicholas had actually left the Winter Palace days earlier, and in his place, they brought in a truckload of troops, ordered to stop Father Gapon from reaching the palace. Hello, good sir, and long live the Tsar. Please, allow me to pass this simple petition to our dear father, Nicholas II. Good day to you too. Please, allow us to respond by opening fire. <laughs> what began as a peaceful protest uh, ended in tragedy. Imperial soldiers opened fire on that's the That's probably the spark Around that broke the camel. Oh, died. The straw that broke the camel's wounded. back. All they wanted was the opportunity to ask Nicholas how many say was... died. A tragedy. How Imperial many... soldiers opened fire on the crowd. Around 200 civilians died. 800 more were wounded. Okay. All they wanted was the opportunity to ask Nicholas to improve their lives. Instead, they were met with bullets. Nicholas didn't personally order the troops to fire, but as an autocrat, he got the blame. The event became known as Bloody Sunday, and Nicholas's reputation plummeted. Strikes A lot of bloody Sundays in history. Empire. Workers' demands increased. Liberals demanded political power. Peasants demanded land. The country was out of control, and the 1905 revolution had begun. I think we should just make Sunday the new day that people hate. You know how everybody hates Mondays? Everybody hates Sundays, because bad stuff always seems to happen on Sundays demanded land. The country was out of control, and the 1905 revolution had begun. Listen, Nicholas, peasants seizing my land and murdering my family I can tolerate, but illegally chopping my wood? That's obscene! And the worse I treat my workers, the more they strike. I don't get it. Everyone relax. As long it's as the, the military monopoly, is still on my side, there's nothing to worry about. Sir, the sailors are starting to mutiny. Well, my life just sucks. With Russia still losing to the <laughs> Japanese, kind of. unrest was growing in the military, and some sailors had even taken to killing officers. Having the people against you was bad enough, but if the military joined in, it would be game over. To make matters worse, in October, workers and Marxists, including one Leon Trotsky, began setting up local elected councils called Soviets that coordinated strikes and supplied the workers. Sergei could see the writing on the wall. Things were going south fast, and he needed a big idea to save the Tsar. And luckily, he had just that. You see, all these angry people from different parts of society weren't really working together, meaning there was a weakness to exploit. 
Sergei wrote a manifesto that would give the liberals an elected assembly called the Duma. It took some convincing, but eventually, Nicholas agreed to share power and have his laws approved by an elected assembly. Hey, liberals, here's your stupid manifesto. Happy now? We certainly are. But what about these guys? Aren't you going to give them what they want? Oh, goodness, no. I was just going to kill them. With the liberals satisfied, and after ending the war with Japan, the Tsar brought thousands of troops home, who then dismantled the Soviets, arrested their leaders, and crushed the peasant uprisings in the countryside. And how about that pesky parliament Nicholas had agreed to share power with? Well, he then wrote a bunch of new laws, which basically said, Hey, remember that manifesto I wrote and how you guys were going to approve my laws? Mm-hmm. Slight change of plan. Actually, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want, and you guys are going to shut up. What? The people won't stand for this. People? What people? Mm. You know, this is why people don't like you. And just like that, Nicholas had survived the 1905 revolution. But wait, a revolution? In Russia? Where was Lenin? Well, Lenin and his communist pals were still in exile. He tried desperately to radicalize the uprising, but all he could do was watch. As the movements failed to organize, the liberals sold out the poor, and the Tsar outplayed the people. Furious, he believed Russia had missed a great chance for a real revolution. From now on, he felt the only way left was an armed revolution by the workers. Watching the events of 1905 unfold, Lenin learned a lot. The Tsar, however, would prove to have learned nothing. After the 1905 revolution had failed, the Tsar's new top man was Pyotr Stolopin, and he had big ideas to prevent any more chaos. Step one, reform agriculture. This will make the peasants love you. And step two, uh, will kill anyone who doesn't. To discourage any more revolutionary ideas, Stolopin began to crack down even harder on the Tsar's opponents, and thousands were sentenced to death. The noose even earned itself a new nickname, Stolopin's necktie. I don't get it. Oh, I see, because it goes around my neck. Wow. <laughs> That's so funny. But despite the oppression, many positive <laughs> reforms were also being made, and the Russian economy even began to improve. This was a problem for Lenin. If the people weren't suffering, then they wouldn't support a revolution. Still in exile and lacking funds, the Bolsheviks simply weren't in a position to do anything. Luckily, it was around this time that Lenin met an incredibly handsome Georgian with your second favorite uh -oh. historical mustache, uh -oh. Joseph Stalin. Lenin there, and Stalin were at a is. communist convention in Finland, and Lenin liked Stalin because he was a real go-getter and was great at fundraising if for the Bolsheviks. this never happened. And by fundraising, I mean kidnapping, robbing, extorting, bribing, ransoming, assassinating, prison breaking, stealing, bank raiding, executioning, and stealing again. Hey Stalin, the Mensheviks aren't so hot in all this stealing, but we still need money. So the next time you do a big heist, just do it quietly. Okay, quietly. Got it. If this isn't quiet, <laughs> I don't know what is. Stalin's wacky antics eventually got him exiled to Siberia, but he had established himself as a big balls Bolshevik. However, Stalin's no amount of Bolshevik balls could stop what was happening. The Russian economy was making a recovery. For the Tsar, things were looking up. This is great. All Nicholas has to do is sit back and not mess anything up. Hey, everyone. Big news. I'd like to introduce you to my new best friend. He's a crazy, drunken, beardy, horny, scandal-ridden magic wizard man. And Rasputin? he smells like a goat. We're screwed. Rasputin. Oh. A dirt poor peasant from dirt poor nowhere. But unlike all the other dirt poor peasants, Rasputin had holy healing powers. And when this holy mystic wandered into St. Petersburg, people began to notice. He quickly became famous, and word of this mystery man in his healing hands made its way to the royal palace. The appearance of a holy <laughs> homeless healer was of great interest to the Tsar and his wife. As far as royals go, they weren't that inbred, but they were just inbred enough for their son Alexei to get hemophilia, or in layman's terms, Mamma mia, that's a lot of blood. Knowing Rasputin could heal people, in 1906, Alexandra asked for Rasputin to come and see if he could cure their son. And crazy as it sounds, Rasputin did heal Alexei, possibly by mm. taking him off his doctor-prescribed aspirin. Having seemingly done the impossible, <laughs> Rasputin became very, very close to the royal family. But having a crazy homeless wizard mm. man hanging around wasn't a good look for the Tsar, because Rasputin was freaky. Not only was he a big fan of alcohol, but he'd also throw these crazy parties with Russian nobility where he'd and all night long and then he'd his whole head if not a guy's and nobody knew how the goat got on the roof. Initially, the press were banned from talking about okay. Rasputin, but eventually the ban was lifted and the tabloids went to town. The whole thing was a huge scandal and everyone was freaked out that this guy was influencing the Tsar and his wife. Nicholas could have spent this period of relative peace improving his image. Instead, he spent it doing this. But as weird as the whole Rasputin thing was, so long as the economy continued to improve and the people's lives kept getting better, maybe Nick would be okay. Maybe there would be no more revolutions. Maybe this video could even end right here. Or maybe things were about to get worse. A lot worse.
You see, the year is 1914, and that means it's time for World War One. It's time for World War One. Well, I'll have the next episode of this released tomorrow, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I want to thank you guys for sitting through this video that has added about 15 minutes to the original runtime. <laughs> There's a bit of uh, long pauses in this video, so hopefully you guys understand how the, the timestamp works. and You can just like move it wherever you want to if you feel like it was long in certain spots. But I was just giving you guys my opinion. Now, of course, that is my opinion. It does not mean everything is 100% solid. I have my own theories about how stuff works. And sometimes it obviously differs with other people. So if you feel like it is different, then don't be... I mean, don't be afraid to voice your opinion. Like I said, this channel is nobody's safe space. I did not make this channel so that... I could only, I could hear a bunch of people saying what I want to hear because like there's some type of giant echo chamber, but at the same time, this channel is about uh, facts. It's about researching. It's about um, being able to be open-minded and persuaded to new things. So don't sit here and try to uh, pass off bullshit um, sources or articles or you know have illogical. Uh, positions or whatever the hell else because I've been all over Twitter there are people out there that say some dumb stuff for some dumb reasons and it seems like almost because of their ego not allowing them to they will double down on it even though they have no evidence for it so if if evidence does not is not on your side it's okay to sit in the I don't know area until something else pops up that can convince you but you have to be open-minded enough to understand, okay, well, maybe what I thought about this, I don't have the evidence for. But I'll just sit here and say I don't know until then. Um, by the way, Twitter, I've said this before. I think that the Internet is too much responsibility for humans. We, there, there are some people that are saying some dumb stuff. And it, like, I used to wonder how like horrible leaders in the past were able to convince so many people to do horrible things but now i see how people are stupid people are people are dumb there's a lot of dumb people out there that will believe and say stupid things not because it's the truth or because they have actual evidence that backs it up but because it's something they already believed beforehand and they just heard something that just reinforces what they believe it's like people are looking to to validate their original beliefs more than they are looking to be convinced of something or to actually discover truth. But whatever. I want to thank you guys for coming through. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I am Devon Da Vinci. I'm going to give you the deuces. Uh, hopefully I will see you guys on a future episode. Uh, well, the next video, which is tomorrow. And I'm going to give you the deuces and I'm signing out. Deuces.